and and you can tell with that this guy or this girl wants to just code or wants to just design or wants to just write you know it's they do the entrepreneur job because it is a manifestation of what they love to do right and there is again upside and downside to upside is that no matter what the market condition they will keep doing it because that's what they like and that's what they they know how to do downside is <laughs> despite the market condition that is the only thing that they do <laughs> that's what they like and <laughs> yeah <laughs> Hi Prashant, good to Hello. see you again. Long time as as usual. Uh, if you haven't noticed, the podcast has actually gone live, and uh, we're getting some good responses. Although there was one brick bat uh, pointed towards you, uh, uh, a good friend from Biconomy reached out, said you guys <laughs> talked about account abstraction and didn't give Biconomy a shout out. So <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we missed that. Missed out on that. It's also a portfolio company, so double the quality. <laughs> okay, just to just to you know even things out, um, we should just invite someone from Biconomy to talk about account abstraction because that's an important yeah. topic, anyways. <laughs> yeah, Aniket's a married man now, so maybe in a couple of weeks we should uh, we should be a little more sensitive of his time. <laughs> now we'll just welcome him to the club. You know, I that's know. what I told him. <laughs> He's moved over to the dark side. Anyways, uh, today we have some interesting things to talk about. But uh, to kick things off, uh, what's happening in the world of crypto? Uh, we'll quickly start with layoffs uh, and layoffs galore. Um, it's it, it, this is always at the onset of any bear, uh, any bear cycle. Uh, we've been in the bear for quite a bit, but I feel like it's really now kind of hitting all of these organizations that we're looking at and. uh companies that had 10 years 20 years runway are suddenly cutting down their workforce from anywhere from 5% to 40% of their workforces so this is quite scary uh, to look at uh what do you make of it uh, prash and uh you know is this something that you foresaw coming or uh, you know are you as blind sided as the people who are being let go are feeling right now see it's a it's a natural progression of a cycle right so again I I started in Morgan Stanley in two thousand seven end. Um, probably mm. the worst time to ever start in banking. And my first two years was all about layoffs. I somehow survived all the landmines, but you know, the, whenever a bear market hits and the earnings take a hit or there's a potential of earnings getting hit, then you try to reduce cost. And one natural effect of that is uh, layoffs. And um, we are seeing that happen, especially around the tech industry and startup industry, both in India, in crypto, and globally. Right? It's just, I think, a natural mm-hmm. progression, um, and um, uh, it's it's uh, it's not yet reflected deeply in the unemployment rate percentages, which is what uh, we track at a macro level. But uh, we we just need to see in next quarters how much this intensifies into the real sectors as well uh, towards layoffs. Right. yeah i mean uh, crypto i think is just the beginning of it we are already seeing it in the other startups uh, in say you know the big ones in india they are already uh, announcing uh, job cuts i think yesterday goldman sachs uh, in uh, various branches in india were uh, were cutting cutting jobs as well so i mean the only thing that we can say is stay safe and probably a great time to perhaps pursue entrepreneurial ambitions uh if you got it uh, i know so many entrepreneurs who have actually like uh yeah. started companies on the back of being laid off and they've gone on to be super uh, super successful uh but uh, you know while that happens uh, are you uh, are you following what's happening with the ftx japan situation i feel like not enough people are talking about it but uh, the story is yeah. that uh, mm. yeah the story on, is on. that uh, there has been very positive regulation that actually protects the retail investor and in the case of insolvency uh, you know the way in which japanese arms of crypto exchanges would uh, would work is that uh, the liquidation first actually goes to the retail investors the users and then kind of the investors are essentially made uh, made whole um, this is a big departure to how everything from a basic standard yc safe is written where liquidation preferences are investors first and then yeah. uh, and then everybody else uh, 
you know, there are two ways of looking at it. One is that, uh, hey, this this is now how not how things are done. But the other is actually the common man who usually gets the raw, uh, raw, uh, rough end of the deal is actually being protected. And the investors should eat it up because they took the risk, uh, which means that they also stand to gain the upside. But in the case of situations like this, the users come first. What do you make yep. of this? And is this a benchmark for way, the way things should go? Yeah, so, um, I mean, whenever you say FTX, I always look at, try to look at it in the rear view mirror because of, you know, how much uh, of brain time it takes. But this is a very um, interesting development with FTX Japan, right? And um, yeah. whenever regulations are laid out, I think the primary motive of regulations are uh, to protect retail uh, customers' interests. And that seems mm-hmm. to have been the case in with FTX Japan, right? The way you have been elaborating on it. And I think I think it makes a lot of sense. Technically, any assets a customer has on an exchange is their asset, right? It's not the uh, uh, exchange's asset anyways. So having a first right on that, uh, especially uh, derived from their hard-earned money, to go back to them, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, if you draw a parallel to the regular industries as well, even when like say, uh, if there is a, a bank in India or UK or the US, right? Um, the retail deposits are protected up to a certain uh, extent by the central bank, right? Um, through uh, mm-hmm. and and that is something that is provided, if, uh, irrespective of whether there is a run on the bank or not, right? So um, or if the bank is insolvent, etc. So again, they are trying to protect retail customers over there. So this this I think is positive and uh, something that um, hopefully uh, can be mirrored into the other exchanges and also other of FTX's um, um, you know bankruptcy proceedings as well. Yeah, let's see how that pans out, but definitely feels it feels right, right? Yeah, and we are also hearing about tokenized treasury bonds. Trash, this is your uh, wheelhouse. <laughs> Tell us what it is and why is it important. Yeah, uh, this is like life coming back full circle, you know. Um, so okay, so <laughs> we have DeFi as technology where we uh, do a lot of trading, lending, borrowing on chain. And uh, what we have seen through the uh, previous two year, last two years, <clears throat> is mostly uh, digital assets or stable coins that get to get traded in DeFi. And uh, there is, you can lend, uh, you know, your stable coin for like a particular interest rate. And that is typically being used for, by uh, traders and market makers, et cetera, on the other side, right? Now, um, DeFi as a technology, and I think, I think I've elaborated on this in the predictions as well, right? Um, DeFi as a technology has a very good use in uh, traditional markets. And uh, what Ondo Finance has done as a use case is that they have brought um, treasuries, U.S. treasuries on chain. What that means is um, U.S. treasury is uh, effectively uh, the debt of the U.S. government, uh, basically them borrowing from uh, institutions and people for their uh, runnings, right? And typically this happens mm. in uh, in bonds and uh, in uh, traditional markets through brokers, dealers, and asset managers. Um, so now, uh, but it had no uh, interaction with DeFi or stable coins. So now what uh, Ondo is doing is with uh, asset managers in between and, uh, you know, uh, trustees, et cetera, they are replicating the risk profile of US treasuries on chain. So going forward, one uh, one can, you know, uh, access US treasury as an instrument in DeFi by, with, say, USDC, right? So uh, it's basically real world assets being tokenized and brought on chain and Given how the interest rates have moved in the last uh, year or so, the this the true year treasury in the US is I think um, yielding around four and a half percent right now, which is significant, right? Uh, a couple of years mm-hmm. back, all of this was like close to zero percent, um, and uh, um, and and now it's four and a half percent. Technically, you would say US treasury rate is risk free rate, so risk free rate of four and a half percent available on chain is very uh, very interesting. And uh, I think I think kudos to Ondo to uh, enable this because this is um, a highly regulated instrument as well. So, um, you know, to bring it on chain is uh, quite uh, commendable. Um, having said that, the, the fl- not a flip side, but uh, usually my, um, my my thought process on real world assets and tokenizing these assets is that um, there is a great use case. Um, however, there is a lot of switching costs involved as well for this something like this to scale, right? So um, um, even, um, bringing it on chain makes, uh, makes sense from technology standpoint. Uh, people can invest into it. However, um, there is a there will be these will be permission pools with KYC and AML. Uh, B you will need to have stable coins to invest into uh, these pools. And uh, C uh, a lot of asset managers might think you know um, why do I have to go on chain for this? Why can't I just do with the regular broker dealers at a similar price, right? So those are things that will uh, need time to get solved. Plus also of course I'm sure we'll need more regulatory clarity on how this can be scaled. 
um but it it's tremendous it's something i've been like uh, keenly following and um, this is a great use case that can be brought into say even countries like india right in india the debt market mm-hmm. and the government bond market is um i would say lower liquidity than the west um tokenizing it bringing it on chain and uh, within maybe say permission of private networks might get a lot of retail investors and uh, the youth excited to participate in such opportunities as well so uh, i th- i think it's got great parallel um i was actually thinking someone like from ondo or someone like you know hamza from polygon uh, could be interesting to uh, have a chat on uh, on this topic because they also went ahead and did a uh, um um product with uh, mas um MAS, in yeah. project guardian right so uh, which was yeah. tokenizing uh, currency swaps um using yeah. um, uni v2 uh, fork so i i think that this is an interesting topic uh, but yeah uh, that, that that's my take on uh, on this it's some proper heavy lifting that we will have to do when uh, <laughs> yeah. hamza and the crew come in uh, you should meet hamza actually he's quite a interesting guy and uh, on the back of his uh, very public twitter spat with uh, with mike dudas we should like to understand what is really happening and we get them both and make them you know get help them make make a kiss and make up here <laughs> anyways uh, other news from my end one of the startups that uh, we were working with pretty closely got accepted into a16c's uh, crypto accelerator so oh, this, wonderful uh, yeah i was quite uh, was really happy when that happened because this was a startup that wasn't really getting purchase when they first uh, came in you know like probably didn't have the right team right balance you, you know the usual things that uh, investors say when you know they're not too sure about uh, you know about, about a founder but uh, somehow uh, you know with the work that they have put in the hustle the traction revenue you know a crypto company with revenue is quite rare uh, all of that put together they have uh, Uh, they they've cracked something aspirational and you know now at least access opens up to them uh, yeah. in a big way uh, so how much how many how much details can you uh, share on this who it is uh, what it is after the call i'll tell you <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> we're very no, happy great man ha- congrats that's yeah. wonderful very ha- very happy with that uh, happening so kind of brings us to brings me to this uh, question right like so what is a great founder uh, and uh, you know what are the characteristics Uh, that you are looking for in a founder if you are looking to join them for a job invest in them partner with them uh, you know uh, somehow there is a feeling that hey this this is a good founder uh, but i think articulating it uh, kind of helps the entire ecosystem in a big way because i see this next wave being very founder driven uh, yeah. and uh, hey it probably always has been founder driven it is just that uh, it gets the founder and their story kind of gets uh, backtracked with the whole uh, industry uh, you know things that keep coming up uh, but uh, i think founders kind of hit the fore a lot more right now and maybe we sh- you know i was thinking we should talk about you know what makes a great founder so prash when somebody comes you know with their pitch deck uh, and you meeting them for the first time what are some telltale signs that you are looking for to reject the founder Uh, and then maybe by law of elimination we can arrive at things that are that we should look for that uh, from yeah. the discord yeah man um I, i think that's a great topic right and um from from a far, especially from our standpoint as well because we look at very early stages it's uh, mostly a founder market fit that we are uh, looking for because there's not a lot of traction that you can gauge anyways right and uh, a big 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 no no for us uh, and even for me right personally would be um, in our space to not have conviction in web3 or have not uh, spent enough time in web3 right or cannot prove that they are committed to this uh, to this ecosystem and uh, you you can do this in multiple ways right um, you can gauge this through uh, someone who, um, what have they been doing how have they been tracking this uh, this ecosystem how much time um, have they spent with other projects are they coming from some other relevant project have they built a personal portfolio do they know uh, how the st- stack adds up uh, etc i think i think that type of like um, um uh, knowledge knowledge sharing with is is quite helpful to understand whether or not someone has conviction and this is not as true in web2 which is why i'm emphasizing on this uh, because web3 whenever probably not now but in the previous 18 months when there is a hype cycle going on it's it's very important to determine that who is in it for uh, the tech as they say uh, versus in it for the money right and uh, that is a big uh, and and we have uh, i've seen a lot of uh, folks who come with like great pedigree as well but they still look at web3 as something 
that they can make a quick buck out of, right? And uh, that is something, um, I mean, one one should definitely try and avoid. Um, the second is, um, again, related to this, but uh, um, uh, an un underappreciation of uh, token as, as an instrument, right? And what I mean by this is uh, anyone who is thinking of when token as opposed to why token uh, uh, very early on in their uh, uh, journey as an entrepreneur in Web3 is... is is somewhere confused in terms of like what is it that is required to uh, build a proper business and um, i'm not saying people should not think of tokens or should not launch tokens but um, it doesn't make sense uh, for a founder to start thinking about it until and unless there is you know early product market fit and uh, hmm. it, it doesn't change whether it's web one web two web three in terms of the basics of having running a business and uh, scaling from zero to one right and uh, you can potentially in some cases use token to growth hack, but then it cannot be the be all end all as a lot of uh, founders uh, think about it in Web3. So I would say uh, when you say um, clear no, no, I would say uh, being more economic and token driven as opposed to business driven, it uh, is uh, is a strict no, no to begin with. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, so I used to write stories about founders, right? Like back uh, almost 10, 11 years ago. Uh, and uh, the, um, we, we uh, I, because of the volume of stories that we wrote, we started to see some trends, right? So we used to start having code words for what kind of uh, entrepreneur it is. And kind of contrary to your belief, uh, the, way we the way we structured them was that at the bottom, we had the ego-driven founders. Uh, and when I say bottom, I'm not saying one is better than the other. It's just that you found more of them. So, the, uh, so they are at the bottom of the pyramid because the spread is much larger. So the number one reason used to be, I want to do something of my own. Uh, or I don't want to work for somebody else, right? So the uh, the upside to it is they're super high ownership guys. Uh, and the downside to it is that uh, they are often broken down by the market reality that you always have somebody to serve. If not yeah. a boss, it's a customer, right? The second layer was money because I think by the time I had started writing stories about founders, the first IPO from India uh, had happened with make my trip and then they're like oh you can actually make money out, out of this and it's better <laughs> than going to a, a big a full-time job uh, and um, you know the there were people who are super objective about what makes money right I think pretty much that's probably what you were saying that token perhaps adds a sense of convolution to it in web3 yeah but uh, the second layer was guys who are super objective about okay big market opportunity here i will build something of, of value here capture this much and i know what the exit is okay so yeah. uh, so the upside is super focused about where the money is made downside is slight deviations here and there market changes their thesis is not right it really kind of breaks them third yeah. category of people are the passionate right so uh, and and you can tell that this guy or this girl wants to just code or wants to just design or wants to just write, you know, it's, they do the entrepreneur job because it is a manifestation of what they love to do. Right. And there is again, upside and downside. Upside is that no matter what the market condition, they will keep doing it because that's what they like. And that's what they, they know how to do. Downside is that despite the market condition, that is the only thing that they <laughs> do. That's what they like. And yeah. that's what they don't. The last kind was, somebody irritated by a problem right and uh, that was the rarest kind of entrepreneur that we could find uh, the uh, they were so they solely existed to solve the problem and again upside downside to it right the upside is that uh, so long it doesn't the size of the problem does not matter to me uh, the you know they will they'll do it because they're interested in it so most of the time from the outside it'll look like they're wasting their time but they are so fulfilled when that problem has been solved, right? Uh, that's the downside. Uh, the upside is obvious that uh, in the case that problem happens to be big, uh, you you know you you the founder themselves are like quite uh, become very well to yeah. uh, or uh, uh, and whoever partners with them uh, do that. So in crypto, I see category one and two. A lot more than category three and four, the ego and the money and the money people, a lot yeah. more than than three and four, right? Like so, um, by that law of elimination, I guess we will not have any founders to invest in or back or work with, you know. So, yeah. So, anyways, uh, I guess the 
two biggest category of founders that we find are money and ego people. Uh, I hope that it it changes uh, it changes over time. So to flip that question around, what would you say are things? Uh, what are some examples of founders where, and you don't have to name them, obviously. You can if you want to. Uh, uh, what are some na- some founders when you looked at them? They they really stood out to you. So what about them stood out to you? And uh, you know, maybe you can share a story, and I'll do the same as well. Yeah, um, I'll, probably not with names because then I'll, uh, I'll I'm not uh, um, you know it should not come across I'm fearing someone more than the other. But I can define a persona, right? If the, I think that that would be more helpful, anyways. Um, in, in my mind, I usually look at this. Uh, I try to look at this as a science than an art. Um, so uh, you know, um, a founder who has proven uh, uh, is a proven founder from the past has uh, scaled from zero to one and uh, has potentially got an exit, not an exit probably doesn't matter as much, but has done the hard work and hustle, right? And knows what it means to uh, be a founder is 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 always someone um, who I would assign a slightly higher probability of success because they have been through the hustle. And uh, that, that is a good profile. Now, of course, it's it's a no-brainer and everyone is looking for that, right? Um, then uh, when, if you come to like a newer founder, right? Then um, it's their uh, deeper conviction in themselves in, ter- in terms of... Uh, trying to achieve what the problem, the statement that they're going after and uh, proving it in some shape or form um, of how they will go about doing it, right, is 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 the great overlap. And the way someone proves this at a founder market uh, founder market fit level at a pre-seed of seed stage to me is that if, if they have sufficient subject matter knowledge, either with themselves or within the co-founding team, then you know that they have seen and faced this problem in the past in a deep way. And... Um, they have been thinking about this solution uh, for a while or they know how to, uh, you know, potentially go after uh, this solution, right? And uh, so that is like the second layer. I, I see a lot of people also uh, coming up in um, Web3 wanting to solve certain, you know, problems which are maybe not even problems today, right? Um, I, I want to create a decentralized Amazon, for instance, right? Sure, I mean, sounds very great, uh, but it it uh, just means that, you know, you have a very uh, deep misunderstanding of um, how, how um, this technology can be used and where, at what stage it is today to even enable or uh, not enable something like this use case, right? So, so which is why I think subject matter knowledge uh, is is, uh, is a bit important. Um, outside of that, you know, there are like uh, certain, certain standard things as well in my mind, usually like um, how to go about constructing your team, who is in it, um, uh, of course, as, as a VC, I always have to look at what the addressable market is that we are going after and not in terms of how you are demonstrating it, but in terms of how I think you can go about uh, accessing it, right? Now, mm. if, if you say fintech market globally is like 10 trillion, whatever, right? I mean, it doesn't make, it, it doesn't mean anything to me at that point. It's about how are you identifying this uh, um, small bubble within this that you will be going after and that will help you from going from uh, zero to one, right? Uh, that is what mm. I'm more interested in, uh, in terms of the founder as well. So that is that is the next category. I'm just trying to come top down over here. Um, and then, of course, there are, there are many times where um, um, all of this add up, but then um, the, the timing piece of it is probably a bit off, right? And um, um, it, you may just be too early or you may just be a bit too late where uh, you already have are facing a lot of competition in that space. And that is more of like more on our side that we try to educate them on. Uh, but it's also something uh, that is that is relevant. Mm. And one thing which which uh, <laughs> finally all of this summarized, this comes from a banking background. Um, and I like laying emphasis on this. The better you are able to construct your pitch deck in like, say, seven or eight slides to demonstrate all of these. Is, is a great barometer to uh, gauge how you think as a person, right? And uh, how you think as a person and how you can distill your thinking and be refined about it goes a long way in showing that you are able to uh, remove a lot of noise out of the system and are like very laser focused in how you are thinking. Mm. So I think people trivialize pitch decks a lot, but when you really look at like certain decks and like eight pages, it's very crisp. It, it shows says a lot about you, your character, and also the amount of discipline you are able to put yourself under. Right. Yeah, I, I guess... I mean, I, I'm probably saying the corollary uh, of some of the things that uh, uh, that you're saying, right? Like, I think some of the best pitch decks that I've seen have been built by not so deserving founders, uh, right? Uh, because anytime there is a anytime there's a method, right? Uh, it can be gamed, 
uh, and uh, people are people are super smart and and i've seen that happen a lot at the very early stage at which I'm, i look at uh, i look at startups right so yeah uh, the one thing that i'm looking for is because it's super early and we catch them early we have the time to see them uh, over a little longer uh, and uh, the one thing that i look for at that time is consistency is this dude saying the same thing and is he working towards the same goal again or to date dude because yeah. of god what have i just dug myself into a hole now anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so it's just the reality guys but uh, uh, but no uh, i'm um, the point i'm making is uh, you know we used to make fun of sandeep back in 2018 and 19 because he was saying the same thing that bitcoin one eth two and a scaling layer on top of eth will be top three and that will be polygon eth is what you need to build and you don't need to build another layer one over and over and over again and i said you got to make him you know like why is he saying this so often but that to me maybe a couple of years later seems to be one of the most important founder traits that i've seen uh one is that you found something non obvious or you found something that is um that's uh something that has a lot of value in and then willing it to reality by yeah. being consistent and show and and progressing against it is probably the greatest founder superpower uh, that uh, uh, you, you know that i have seen and and maybe to a large extent the most valuable companies in the world uh, you look at that you look at those companies when they were super early you'd just probably be like who's going to use that right like or who needs that who asked for this but you know just having that belief and confidence uh is i feel something uh, i mean confidence in your belief that this is something that is real and can work is something that i really look for at the uh, at the super early stage and i don't care what the deck looks like at that time because <laughs> now i've seen it yeah. being enough times in fact now it's an anti signal if i see a very well done deck right uh, i'm like okay at that uh, stage oh yeah definitely yeah. so i mean <laughs> just, just the scheme just to uh, give some context here to people so so, so raghu um, you know operates at like if you have come up with an idea that you want to do something about then you know yeah um, raghu operates at that level right so y- yeah. you have to go from there to at least uh, bake bake on that idea and do some like say either an alpha or like a poc something to kind of get to a stage where uh, you know you then can explain that idea to a lot more people and start uh, gain, generating traction on it once mm. you do that is where probably i come in from my uh, vc hat right it's still like i would say early stage That's fair. but but we don't come in at like a stage where it's just an idea right uh, we can yeah. nothing stops us but we don't typically that's not uh, yeah. where we operate so um, so i think that is that context is important we are both early stage but you are super super early <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true uh, so i guess progress to me is the number one thing the second biggest thing that i really like in in founders is being able to rally a core team together right mm-hmm. uh, one of my favorite investors uh, you know vinod kosla uh, he says that look at look at the first three people that they hire and how long they've stayed with them when you when you want to invest in uh, when you want to invest in these people so i you can judge a founder like how you can judge a man by the company that they keep i really have to change my vocabulary dude this is bad <laughs> but uh, you can judge a person by the by the <laughs> by the company that they keep uh, and uh, uh, sec- uh, you can similarly judge a founder by the by the first few people that they hire uh because that shows a borrowed conviction from people who have decided to put their time and effort and the best years of their life into you know working with this founder and secondly uh, it also shows capability that those players are going to attract other good players that uh, they will need when when they hire so that co-founder uh, two co-founders and the first three people uh, who work with them i think is very very important uh, yeah. which which i see and that capability of a founder to really rally very high achieving smart people uh, at an early stage i think is uh, is super important i think at the stage at which you are looking at startup some of these teams will be there is that something you give emphasis yes. to oh definitely definitely um see i mean um, even at like the early stage that we operate 
how the team has come together is important to us but by then they would uh, have you know some sort of like an mvp or a slightly uh, more you know quantifiable metrics that uh, we would typically be looking at um and and um, um, you know the reliance uh, the founder is still the most important guy over here and the founding team as well but just slightly ahead of the curve slightly ahead in the curve right next uh, contentious question i'll ask you is being humble as a founder overrated <laughs> oh man um being humble because as a i founder. okay I'll, i'll tell you my experience okay i meet very humble founders and uh, i find them sometimes lacking in ambition sometimes the humility is fake okay they are actually pretty you know pretty thinking ar- uh, thinking arrogantly and then secondly i look at very confident cocky founders who walk the walk also mm-hmm. right uh, now i like i am turned off by overt displays of confidence but i'm tr- i'm realizing that that is a bias and probably something that's yep. come from my childhood of what i have what i have seen and i started to now i'm questioning myself that you know is is humility an anti signal or what uh, and if if it uh, if it's not what is how do you know that it's real uh, yeah. is the is is what i'm getting at so uh, what are your thoughts on it right like, see i mean really that... yeah see I, for mm-hmm. me right i i it, it's very difficult biases and prejudices arise all the time right at uh, every stage mm-hmm. of this process um i i try my level best to uh, not judge at all with my own biases and uh, let the work speak for itself so um and um from that standpoint whether he is humble or whether he or she is humble he or she is cocky or arrogant right um as long as they are able to demo, i mean you know are uh, demonstrate those things that i explained that deep conviction the uh, very good understanding of the problem statement and uh, a real genuine hustle uh, attitude right then the, the, those are the traits that i'm looking for and i try not to delve too much into the uh, uh, personal side of things now where it becomes a um, um uh, where where i would obviously um, uh, put my foot down is where you know it's not treading on a thin line of hustling but where it becomes more on the side of you know um potentially going uh, illegal or like unethical right mm-hmm. and and that is where mm-hmm. i kind of draw the line but otherwise you know it's it's mostly personality traits to me that i am mostly okay with yeah yeah i mean I, i'm trying to unlearn that right uh, and yeah. uh, and i've I've, be, i've been guilty of uh of of not giving as much attention as i should have about a few founders that i thought were cocky but mm. over time i'm like okay maybe that's not such a bad thing maybe they're being real and they're owning who they really are uh, yeah. and and maybe that works for the business who am i to yeah. judge i'm not building it right like so yeah, yeah. and i see i mean so, this is this is also like the appearances you have to maintain are like uh, it's very important right it puts a lot of pressure on people as well um in terms mm. of wanting to be seen as how the society or the community wants to perceive you right and uh, that is too much pressure as well and uh, some something i mean i at least try not to uh, get uh, deeper into sure uh makes makes sense this discussion is becoming deeply personal dude at some point <laughs> but <laughs> uh what is leadership to you because that's a uh, important founder trait i know what it 100% looks and feels like but what is it man to me it's like um there there is a storm i'll be the first person in the line protecting everyone behind me that has to be the founder trait whether it's uh, good times bad times you know worst times with product marketing legal you have to be there to kind of you know take it on the chin that that's that's leadership yeah. to me so lead from the front lead by example if they do yeah. that then got it okay i think i think it's pretty much the same sam manikshaw who's a field marshal of the indian army actually has a exceptional talk on what leadership is uh, it's a one hour long conversation where he gives a very funny borderline chauvinistic conversation about what it means to lead but totally worth uh, worth watching i think there is he's he's been able to articulate it quite well and um... let me put it Yeah, just just the, just since, since you brought that point right and you should share that with me i would love to uh, uh, go through it and yeah of course if you're adding it in the notes that's great um yeah. leadership also should not mean that you know i uh, have to necessarily yell or like show my supremacy to get job done 
the calmer you are in getting it done with limited amount of energy is how you kind of sustain yourself over a longer period yeah. of time and you get respect in the process right um so um you can be a great uh, you mean you can get work done but you know the ideal leader is probably one who also uh, gets respect in the process that's true that's true also leadership styles are different man so that's another thing that uh, i have i'm starting to learn that some people like a particular kind of leadership some people like the strong quiet uh, type and maybe that define that goes into culture and all of those things maybe we should talk about that in a later podcast so anyway, I'm, yeah. i'm at my last I'm, i'm at my last point okay and i have a web two example of uh, uh, for what a great founder is but i think it definitely applies in web3 especially in this market so the founder of bharat matrimony told me this story where uh, he had a he had a, a he had been laid off uh, and uh, he decided okay you know what i'm going to start this company which uh, you know does matrimonial services but online uh, he obviously struggled to get funding and i think uh, one large web to vc fund gave him a term sheet and on the day that he was signing it they said they told him uh, hey um, all, all this is fine what will you do if i take this term sheet away now okay and uh, he apparently looked dead in that uh, investor's eye and said uh, it will be hard i'll probably take a couple of more years to do it but i'll do it and he started to walk out of the room and that's when they like no 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 wait <laughs> you're joking, joking. <laughs> you know sign, sign it that to me i think is the ultimate founder trait at the level which a level at which i am looking at it this unwavering belief in what in what you are doing is right and yep. getting other people to believe in that and again kind of mix of all the other things that uh, that uh, that you have and maybe the best word to showcase that is persistence right uh, i think it's in, we tell our founders this at builders tribe almost all the time that it is important to show up especially on the bad days yeah and uh, uh, i think like that's that one thing irrespective of all the other things in the in the in the book uh, is what is most important to me as a founder and that's what i'm i'm looking for yeah and just to uh, yeah. add to that so even, even as a vc hat right um i i would say that um, founders who can go the farthest uh, sorry not the farthest uh, founders uh, looking at vc should not look to convince the vc to uh, buy their idea they should be convinced from within that they want to do this idea with or without the vc right and uh, mm. that is that is i think a very important trait as well uh, which is pretty much mm. what uh, you know that uh, example also uh, demonstrates yeah yeah i mean you are going to build the business and you need to you know believe that and act accordingly anyways this episode became a lot more heavier than i expected it to be right <laughs> old old memories and things like that and it's a different type of ex- episode that we try to do uh, give us feedback is this do you like uh, this uh, you know preachy stuff if you do like it then maybe we should do a little more of it there are very interesting topics to talk about here uh, and uh, Then yeah, Prash. Any last, any any words before uh, we move on to the next podcast? Um, not not really. I think this was interesting. Um, uh, I I might I might write something about it to also help like the founders out there in 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 case they wanted a bit more pointed, uh, um, uh, you know, approaches from VCs in terms of what we are looking for, just to guide them. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, it comes down to you know having that mindset and that uh, persistence. I think is the right word uh, from their side. amongst all the other things that we explained here so yeah you do reach us reach out if you have any more uh, queries otherwise yeah we'll move yeah. on to the next one awesome uh, which is in one hour from now oh wait actually it won't make a difference to people listening to it right <laughs> <laughs>